We're taking a look at some Android apps. In this video, we are looking at the Wallabag Android app. We've looked at the Wallabag source code in another video, and we also looked at parts of the Android app. This will just be a short video, trying to remind myself what they were up to, and maybe looking at different parts of the Android app that we hadn't looked at before. Um, I believe the first time around, I was mainly looking at text-to-speech, although I haven't rewatched the video. I will rewatch it after this now that I realize I looked at Android, but I haven't rewatched it yet. And of course, you should watch it too. And this is Ants are Everywhere, and we're reading source code. Okay, so I just explained to people watching the live stream, but uh, I'm going to cut that part out when I post this video. Wallabag is a, is a bookmarking app. I'm using it here. I can open a page like Kraken. I don't remember if it's an E. I think it's an E. And I can uh, use the, the, the Firefox keyboard shortcut to save it to my Wallabag. And then if I were to log in to, to Wallabag, I would see this Wikipedia article here. And then if I'm going to go like cut the grass or drive to pick up my kids or whatever, I can listen to the Kraken article in an audio version, so I don't have to read it. I spend a lot of time in front of screens during work, so it's nice to be able to have sources of content that are audio-based, um, but eventually you exhaust all of the all of the podcasts and you you get tired of hearing about Squarespace. So it's nice to have other things that you can do. Okay, so uh, Android has a pretty straightforward-ish setup, I think. So in the um, in the root directory, there's Gradle stuff. Gradle is, I think, technically a build system. It's usually, when I was doing it, it was, when I was doing it, it was written in Groovy, which is a Python-like language on the JVM. I've been told recently that you can write it in Kotlin. Apparently, you can also write uh, Groovy, uh, sorry, Gradle stuff in Java as well, and Scala. Um, and it's build automation. I never really cared for it myself, but that's but that's Gradle. We have a, a folder for icons, a README folder. I'm not, I don't think that's like standard uh, Android stuff. I think that maybe they just put Readmes in there. And then a, an app directory, which has a source directory with some more Gradle stuff and some debug, um, I guess, resources and some release resources and then main. That's the standard. Um, the standard Android stuff. And then uh, this is also standard. I think there's an assets directory in main and a, a, a res, which I believe is resources, right? Yeah, these are like icons and stuff. And then this is Java. So we have a bunch of mostly empty directories like fr galapo apps and posh, which is, I believe, just French for pocket. Pocket is the Uh, read it later app that's built into Mozilla Firefox that I disable every time I install Firefox. Um, okay. And so text to speech and UI, I think is probably mostly what I focused on before. It might be interesting to look at service, but I, I think I mainly want to look at uh, data. Um, and they're using data access objects. I'm uh, peeking in the other window here because I decided I do kind of want to see what I looked at before. But I can't really tell what file I'm looking at. All right. At any rate. So in software, a data access object, or DAO, is a pattern that provides an abstract interface to some type of database or other persistence mechanism. By mapping application calls to the persistence layer, the DAO provides data operations without exposing database details. So it's a database abstraction. There's lots of them. Um, and uh, I don't know if this... So the, let's see, Android 
what I want to know is, is Android still suggesting this pattern? Accessing data using room DAOs. When you use the room persistence library, you store your apps data to, to store your apps data. You interact with the stored data by defining data access objects or DAOs. Each DAO includes methods that offer abstract access to your apps database. At compile time, room automatically generates implementations of the DAOs that you define. Okay. So I forget exactly how this is done. We'll look, we'll see, I think an example, they probably are using room, but I'm not sure. But basically, uh, it's maybe similar in spirit to forms, object relation managers, mappers. I don't remember what the M stands for, but um, in a lot of cases, you just want to, you essentially want to persist your application data to disk. And you want to do that in an efficient way. So you want to use a database, but um, you've already written your application logic and that's going to change over time. And so, it's nice to have some sort of tooling that makes it easier to focus on just the application side and have the database side take care of itself. You could in theory, just focus on the database side and have, uh, like automatically generate the, uh, the application level, like classes and stuff. That's kind of that would, conceptually. That's a little bit how protobuf works, maybe internally at Google. The databases, you can kind of describe them uh, as as uh, storing protos, similarly to how you might store JSON objects uh, outside of, of Google. And the protos also generate the application level code for manipulating objects and stuff. All right, so it seems like this is up-to-date documentation. It seems like... Um, Android is still okay with you using DAOs. They do change stuff like all the time. Why do we need to use a DAO and repository in the same something or other? This is from two years ago. I'm working on a path project to learn Android deeply. What is a path project? Is this a concept of, of in learning? So it says room is a layer over the SQLite database. I'm pretty sure we've looked at the SQLite code. Let me verify this. And so room is a layer of the SQLite. DAO forms the main component of the room persistence layer. We use queries to perform CRUD operations. On the other hand, a repository class is something that abstracts access to multiple databases. Okay, yes, we have looked at SQLite. And so let me ask, Maybe ChatGPT. I'll say, tell me about the main differences between uh, ORM and DAO with respect to databases. ChatGPT is just going to hang. So while it's looking at that, let's go back to the code. Okay, so we have some a bunch of DAO objects. These are just, I think, just going to be like one object, per, maybe per table or per, per, yeah, it must be per table, right? And then we have a bunch of things like list types, list adapters. Maybe this is for taking the, so this is just the data directory. This is not necessarily database, but perhaps this is for taking the data and putting it in a list, like a, a list of articles. We also have a queue helper, which I am going to look at. I usually don't look at helpers, but I'm kind of curious to see what they're doing. We have settings, a storage helper. Settings, I think Android provides uh, uh, a special, maybe like a key value store for saving setting data that is not a, that is not at the database level. It's maybe for th storing things like your username. I don't know how password storage works. I don't remember. Presumably that gets protected by the secure enclave. Yeah. So ChatGP is literally just going to say, try again in all caps. Okay. 
Uh, so what, what, what? So here's the DAO stuff. We have article DAO, article tags, join DAO, DAO master, DAO session, FTS DAO. What is FTS? And Q item DAO. It just occurs to me looking at this that I don't know, uh, how do you store like a queue, like a reading list in a database? I don't think that's obvious. You could, for example, store next to each item, the order of the item. Like if your first article is about Kraken, you could store, store a, a one for Kraken. And if your next article is about Android, you could store a two for Android. But that doesn't really work because you're going to want to like swap two things. And then when you swap them, you're going to have to update the identifiers of everything that comes after either of them. You could try to do maybe like a linked list sort of approach, but I don't know how you store a linked list in a database. So the key differences between Orm and DAO. Orm provides a higher level of abstraction, automating much of the interaction with the database, and DAO is lower level. I think that's really the main thing is that you, you are actually like modeling the database and you have SQL statements in your code. DAO has full, full control of the, over the queries and so on and so forth. So what are the disadvantages? Uh, performance overhead for ORM, complex queries for ORM, and the point of DAO is encapsulates all access to the data store and provides an abstract interface, the underlying database. I don't, I don't know how this is really different from just having a, a SQL, uh, uh, um, by just accessing SQL it, it may be a relatively thin layer. In fact, we could maybe look at room at some point if we wanted to. Okay. So back to the code. So here's Q helper. No, before we get the Q helper, let's look at a, a few of these DAOs. Let's look at article DAO. So importing a bunch of stuff, including database cursor, which is an Android, uh, library, a, Android SQLite library as well, which has a SQLite that uh, we're importing SQLite statement and we're importing abstract DAO, whatever that is. I guess this green robot dot green DAO is some third party library that I guess these developers like that has something like an abstract DAO property, a DAO config, et cetera, et cetera. This code was generated. Edit it with caution. Okay. So this is generated code. Hello, Ant. Hello, Justin. Um, okay. So I wasn't realizing that this is generated somewhere. We should see the stuff that generates it, but we see what, uh, a bunch of properties. These look like database tables. We have the art, the ID, the article ID, title, domain, URL, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have this create table, which just is calling DB exec SQL with a SQL statement that is we're interpolating with strings. Uh, yeah. And whatever this bind value is. So bind values is going to take a database statement and an article entity, I guess, and do, uh, binding. Hopefully that's like actual binding and not just string substitution, but this is, this is very database-y and this is the generated code and it's clean. You can see what all the stuff is doing. Here's a DAO master. Is this generated code? This code was generated. Edit it with caution. So DAO master extends abstract DAO master. And it's just going to guess like, uh, essentially loop over the stuff. So we're, we have this create all tables, which is going to, it knows because it's generated what all of the DAOs are at the time of generation. And it's going to call all of their create tables methods. And if you want to drop all tables, you can drop all the table methods, etc. And then we've got this registered DAO class thing. Okay. DAO session, I'm going to guess is also generated. Okay. It is. Presumably that's for database sessions sessions. What is this FTS thing? This, I don't think is generated. At least there's no, uh, uh, comment that I see FTS are, uh, trigger names. 
FTS. I'm not sure yet, but we have a bunch of triggers like the article added insert FTS, blah, blah, blah. I guess I just scrolled past it. So using FTS for FTS ICU tokenizer enabled. I'm not sure, but we're just going to plow along. Uh, I kind of want to know now, where's the Android stuff? So Android DAO examples. I want to see if, if there's anything interesting to look at from the code that causes the, the DAO to be generated. And let's look at the Java code. So um, we have some interface user DAO. And we have function insert all. It's going to take a user of, um, I forget <laughs> the name for this thing, but it, it'll take multiple users. I guess you can put them in comma separated, like a uh, very, very variable number of arguments. Um, we have delete of user and these annotations, I guess, essentially tell room which SQL query to, to generate. And if you know that you're supposed to delete a user object, then it's pretty easy to, to, to figure out how, what code you're supposed to write. Especially if you can, if you control all of the SQL queries, which I think is the idea that DAO does. Um, somewhere we should define what a user is though, right? I guess the users may be just like a Java type somewhere. Okay. Actually that's, Undo that. And we'll look for uh, insert. I don't know how to search for an at sign in GitHub. What if I escape the at sign? What if I just search for insert? I don't really see it, but that's not the end of the world. We'll move this out of the way for a second. Okay, so let's look at some of the other stuff. The Q item DAO, uh, we should, uh, actually, we should be able to see maybe Q item. Yeah, here we go, DAO entities. So we have an we have an at entity, which just maps the table Q item, and some enum uh, called action I think, and the actions are add link article delete article changed article tags delete. So these are essentially events or actions that uh, will will store it maybe I guess in the database as a record of the intent, and then there should be some service that. Um, that ensures that that intent is acted upon. We're over 15 minutes, but I'm actually just going to keep going because I'm enjoying and learning a little bit here. Uh, we also have this article change type. You can um, archive the article, favorite it, title, uh, I guess maybe change its title, change its tags. I guess you can't like refresh the article. Although I know you can in the app, I don't know how that's handled, but I guess it's not an article change type. And so I guess a Q item doesn't seem to have anything to, anything to do with queues other than it's like you're, you're reading Q. I mean, it's the, it's an item in the queue. I don't think that's necessarily, well, we'll see. So a Q item is a thing, is its own thing. Where are we now? We are still in the public class Q item. I guess this is like a, Constructor or a converter? Where was I? Here. I guess this is a constructor. It has a queue item is a thing that has an ID, a queue number, an action, an article ID, a local article ID, and and two essentially extra strings for uh, really for I assume for flexibility, being able to extend the functionality by like passing things like keys and values 
or uh, stuff that's not fully implemented in the database or whatever. All right, so I, I don't know what, um, I guess the ID is the ID of the queue item. I don't know what the queue number is. Maybe this is the order or the priority or, or something along those lines. The action, I guess every queue item has an action. So I, I guess this is not for just like storing articles in a queue. I guess this is storing for storing uh, actions to be taken on articles. We have this thing that's called specific item. I don't know if that's worth looking at. We have queue helper. I think we did open queue helper. We have settings activity, DAO session. Okay. So let's move along. We'll come back to queue because that is really one of, to me, one of the mysteries of an app like this is how you, what's the right way to think about uh, putting a queue in a database? It, this is DB connection. This is just going to be a, a database connection. We're using, I think, SQLite, although we may, uh, we communicate with the Wallabag backend to do stuff. And there's a database on the backend, but I don't think we have like write or read access to that database. And we just have some session, I guess, even though the database is just local on disk, you need some session management for, so that different threads and stuff can be aware that the database is open and whatnot. Here's DB utils. We just have run in non-exclusive TX. So you give it the DAO session, a runnable, which is a consumer of DAO session. I guess it's a, a something you can execute that um, depends on a DAO session, perhaps. And then we have the SQLite database, which we're going to get by, I know this is not part of the argument, this is just the next line, but we're going to get the SQLite database by just calling session get database and get raw database. So get database must be some abstraction of the raw SQL uh, pointer or whatever. It's Java, so it's not literally pointers, but whatever they're called in Java, or some reference you can follow to get to, to the SQLite database. And then we're gonna call this uh, begin transaction non-exclusive and with the trends, with the, with the try finally block. Which is maybe a little bit weird because I don't know what happens with the exception. If there's an exception, I assume you want to roll back the transaction. Maybe that happens automatically. But um, I guess end transaction will roll it back perhaps if the if set transaction successful never is called. Something along those lines. Uh, storage helper. You have things like copy file result. This is, I guess, just like uh, error semantics for copying stuff. OK, I'm guessing means copy was OK. Source does not exist. Source cannot read, cannot read source, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, I'm surprised this is not, there's not some better uh, well-known solution for this, but this is maybe for logging and stuff like that. And we have read raw string, giving it an int. Maybe the int is the string identifier. We call read raw string unsafe on the ID. Yeah. Okay. So given the ID, we'll, we'll do what? So we'll have, we'll call app that get instance that get resources and on research resources, we'll try to open raw resource ID. So that's, uh, this is like an, the, this ID is like an Android ID. And this is just wrapping like the Android functionality, I guess we have an external storage path which is the DB path. I don't know what external means. This might mean that you can save it on an SD card or something outside the outside of the, uh, the app directory, the app sandbox. And we have things like whether the path is writable, uh, copying files. Writing, writing a file copying routine is something I would strongly prefer not to do uh, because uh, people have been doing it since like the 1960s and have the existing libraries, 
uh, must catch all of the, even the craziest edge cases. So I feel like you can't really compete with that kind of rob robustness. All right, uh, so here's settings.java. I think that settings just gets stored. Yeah, you have some app get settings. If it's first run, like this is the first time we're running the app, then we're going to set first run false, I guess, because we've considered ourselves already run. And we're going to call, we're going to start the run wizard, the connection wizard activity. That will probably do things like it'll ask you for what's the URL of your wallet bag uh, instance. It's like wallet bag is self hostable, so you can put that there. Enable a component. Uh, I don't know what this is doing. Something about package managers, components. I don't know what a component is. We're, we can initialize preferences. So one thing I've noticed about the wallet bag app, and mine's probably a little bit out of date by, by about a year or so. I don't know how fast development happens. But um, every time I open the app, there's some chance that the uh, text-to-speech voices have changed between the Google voices and the Samsung voices. I don't know why that is, but somewhere I think there's probably um, a setting that's not being uh, either persisted correctly or they're selecting maybe the, um, the, the text-to-speech voices via an index into some list and maybe that list doesn't have a um, static structure. Maybe it can change depending on conditions on the phone. All right, and so I'll close that down. This is a queue helper, which I haven't figured out yet if this queue is just the queue of actions to take on articles or if it's also the, the like reading list order. Um, and then there's service. Let's look quickly at service. We have action request, action result. Let's pull this out into its own thing maybe. Alarm helper, alarm receiver, boot receiver, callable parameterized adapter, main service, operations helper. So, uh, okay, so these are like maybe like types or data structures. Parsable is a thing in Android, I forget what it is, it's for parsing some sort of uh, object. We have task service, wallet bag job service. So this is some implementation of like background jobs, workers. Okay, we have like article as file downloader, article, Im article image loader, images fetcher, update worker, updater, offline changes, synchronization. So this is going to be things like um, uh, synchronization. So if you add a, one thing I've noticed, is uh, if I'm like in the subway in New York and I don't have cell phone connection, I can add a file, I, I can add a URL to Wallabag Android and it will not show up on my reading list there. But once I get network connectivity, I guess in the background somewhere, it will have told the server about the article and the server will somehow indicate to the, uh, to the, Android app that it should now display the article in the reading list. And I'm getting, we're getting facts <laughs> about Henry Ford from David Salamanca. Did you know that Henry Ford did with the motor what you are teaching here at the code? I did not. He would just take it apart, analyze it, read some concepts about it, to learn how to make it. That's cool. I didn't know that about him. It took approximately 12 years to come up with the first boogie. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Late. What th I'm just curious, Elsie. What time is it uh, near you? Is that what you mean by late? Oh, you, or maybe you're like catching up to the stuff that I said before. So I'm um, I'm reading what Elsie is saying. It's on the screen and is information dense. So maybe I won't read it entirely out loud. Let me get a sense of of what it is, and I can maybe um, paraphrase stuff. Uh, so DAOs are mostly defined by wrapping SQL in code level operations, typically one-to-one -one correspondence between the database objects 
Yeah, okay. Repositories from the DDD. Okay, so this is when I think I was looking at that Stack Overflow question. No, I feel like I'm looking at somebody when I'm looking at their chat, but I'm looking away from my camera. So maybe the effect is lost. Maybe you need a camera that follows where the chat is. The repositories are less granular. They'd be at the so-called aggregate root levels. Like line item bunch within invoice. Okay, so some group of of uh, databases, I think the way that the, maybe they stack overflow. Form is just a piece of middleware, middleware to handle not having to write anything like the above manually. Okay, so it's at a higher level up. Cool. Thanks. Watching a portfolio amount. Yep. You know what? The stock market is going crazy. By going crazy, I mean in sharp decline. Is that what you mean by portfolio? Because if so, it's true. What is like one of the um, rating view, maybe? One of these people will show me a free chart. <laughs> yeah. Apple. It tells me a lot about who you think your clientele are. Okay. Yeah. I I was slightly long this morning, but now I am short. Uh, I think the I think the outlook has has changed. We're getting more information about like I think Amazon released some stuff about consumers not not being too. Uh, I forget what their wording was. But, the, but basically, the shopping data is aligned with some of the other economic data. That suggests to me that this is um, going to last longer than just a few days or whatever. All right. That's stock markets are everywhere. Okay. So uh, workers. Um, so let's article update worker. I don't know what, what really these things are doing. So they have some um, interface, presumably, the base network worker. It's going to be some uh, worker that needs network. Um, it's got this update uh, method. It doesn't seem to be overriding anything. So I, I guess it's not part of the, any interface. And I guess in Java, I think you say implements blah to say that it implements an interface as opposed to extends. So update takes an action request. Action request, I think, is is general. I think that uh, probably an interface that all actions implement. And then from the action request, we're going to call new update article started event on the action request and get an update articles started event. And we'll post sticky event. Post sticky event. I don't know what that means, but we'll look that up. Um, and then we'll call update articles on the action request, not the event, and get a result. And if that fails, I have no idea what we'll do, but if it, uh, either way, I guess we'll do nothing if it fails. But either way, we're going to, uh, in this finally block, remove the sticky event, the start event, and if the result is null, I guess that means it failed for some reason, uh, we're going to set a new action result the error type is unknown. It seems like uh, maybe there could be an accept block that, or, or perhaps we could get information from the result, but at any rate, we just say we don't know what the error is. And then we post event, which is not sticky, and the event is update articles finished event action request result that will record somehow in some database, maybe just the local database, that this thing failed. And update articles is the real thing that's doing work. And here is its implementation. It takes an action request and gets the update type. I'm not sure what the update type is. We're going to log some stuff. And um, create a new action result, which we set to null. If the network is available, then we're going to get the settings. 
I don't know if that requires the network. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to create a new article update listener, which has the following implementation. It's got an on progress callback, which we will post the event that the, there's been some progress passing the, the current progress. And we've got this on success uh, callback. And when the success has been succeeded, then we set the latest updated timestamp. This is, I guess, setting the database. I think this is setting um, on the database when we last updated the article. The last update run timestamp will be the current time in milliseconds. I don't know where we got this latest updated. Oh, okay, that's from the that's from this function. And then we set first sync done to true. Okay. And there's and again, there's no like failure callback, I guess. And then we get an article updater, which takes in the, the DAO session and the uh, Wallabag service that gives us a variable called updater. And then we create an event, or we set the event rather, to the result of updater.update with the update type and some information. And here we have some error handling. If, the, if there's an unsuccessful response exception or an IO exception, then we call process exceptions, passing in E, with the update articles. I think this is maybe a form of logging. We call our update of R. And then uh, otherwise, if we just have any other exception, we do some, um, some error stuff. All right, so what did I want to know? I want to know what post sticky event is. It's an event helper. Event processor. You deleted some stuff. Okay. Um, we have create event bus. Event bus dot builder. Uh, send. Uh, so there's some event bus. But uh, what? It's the green robot event bus. I don't know if this is like the developers of the of the app is if, if this is their if they're somehow affiliated open source libraries to make apps and app development fast and fun less boilerplate and managing infrastructure code event bus number one publish subscribe event bus optimized for android and green down okay so maybe this is a well-known uh org um event bus So if I just search for event bus Android, I get a link to the green robot people. And I'll say, I need class Gemini and event bus for my Android app. What are my options? Optinos. And event bus is a powerful tool. Some popular, uh, blah, blah, blah. Sticky events, event priorities, auto, created by Square, but now deprecated. Some alternatives are XJava, live data and view model, custom event bus. I'll ask who makes the event bus. So I guess Green Robot, they seem to be in the event bus. To draw a picture of an event bus. Before you draw, list some kinds of events that would make a good picture. Uh, I meant to type more, but I accidentally hit return. It's pretty good. This one has lots of penguins, it looks like. Uh, 
I'll say I like the second picture of the double de the yellow double decker bus. But add more penguins. Also describe what events the penguins are going to. And they'll happen in the background. Okay, so we have this event bus thing. This is from this. They seem to be relying on this uh, green robot library, which is uh, cool. I don't know what makes an event sticky. Man, let's just find out. We can try green robot sticky events. Some events carry information that is of interest after the event is posted. For example, an event signals that some initialization is complete, or if you have some sensor. Oh, okay, so I guess maybe... I guess uh, events are meant to be like temporary for the most part, and I guess sticky events stick around in some sense. Uh, but where are the events stored? Are they stored on the in the database? Let's look up DAO. I don't know. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to go too far afield there. Um, all right. So there's some event event bus. They have this article updater logic, and this is offline changes synchronizer. This is maybe the thing that I was mentioning that happens when you're like in the subway. You have synchronize with some action request. Sync queue started. Uh, sync offline queue is network available. We get the database stuff, the queue helper. We uh, have some counter. The total number is the queue size. And we are going to, for each item, get the article ID. Can tolerate not found is set to true. We're gonna okay. So if the article is changed, we're gonna try to sync article change, sync delete tags from article, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I guess maybe the way that we're doing is that instead of syncing the database, we have um, uh, we're maybe just using the API, the REST API or something of the server to keep the databases in in sync. Let's look at just an arbitrary one: sync add annotation to article. You have some item, add or update annotation item, and then the article ID. And it may throw a, a configuration exception or an unsuccessful response or an IO exception. And we get the DAO session. And we get we, we use a query to get the annotation. If it's null, that's an error. And then we have this list. Wallabag.api wrapper.models.annotation.range. Ranges is a new array list um, that is the same size as the uh, annotation ranges that I think we got from the DAO, from the SQLite database on the on the mobile app, on the device. And then for each annotation range that's on the device, we are going to create this whatever this API wrapper business is. This is, I guess, some um, wrapper for probably for the the REST API for the Wallabag web uh, web server. And we're just like setting the uh, um, the API range. We're just setting the information from the the Java stuff that we had stored on the, the device of SQLite, and then we'll call ranges.add API range. And that's creating one range one api range for each range i guess we have on disk and then we have this re we're getting uh from the wallet bag service we're gonna call add annotation blah 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 and we get a remote annotation i think that this is probably the thing that's calling the the uh the server and that's why we get a remote annotation and if it's null then we failed to properly uh, tell the tell the server about our annotation, I think. Otherwise, uh, on annotation, which is the one we got from the DAO, 
please set its annotation ID to the remote ID and update it. I don't know if it didn't have an ID before or if it just had a... Maybe that's what the local ID, it has a local annotation ID. And I'm not, I'm curious if that's the, if that's the key, what's it called, the primary key? Okay, so now I'm, I'm getting a sense of how of how their how their stuff works. And then the last thing I want to know is about um, playlists or reading lists. I'm guessing that's related to the queue stuff. I have a bunch of uh, queue stuff open. This is operations workers. I'm assuming that's mainly going to be just like, like executing delete, deleted article sweeper. This may be just synchronizing, but um, I'm guessing if you've deleted articles, maybe it it maybe it marks them as softly soft deleted, like it, it says to delete to true, and then eventually you reclaim that disk space or something. Image fetcher, this is going to fetch stuff. I'm curious whether this fetches from the original image URL or if the Wallabag server serves these images up to you. Um, we've got more sticky event stuff. Fetch images. We have some stuff about storage, external storage. We're going to get the article DAO from the DAO session. And we have a query builder. Ordering. We're only looking at things where the images are not downloaded. So we have uh, some entry in the database. That, so we when we preserve the article to the database locally, I guess on the device, we probably always do that uh, with no images downloaded and say that images downloaded is false. And then this probably periodically runs and downloads images and then sets the images downloaded to true. Once that's done, is I'm guessing how it's done. And we do that by order of article ID, which is probably basically the order that you added the articles. And we create a new article changed event. Um, we have some, process, some list of processed articles and changed articles. We set DB query size to 50. And I guess we do only 50 articles at a time, which seems like a lot if you're downloading images on your phone. Because often phones, I mean, my phone is often connected to my Wi-Fi if I'm in a building. Um, but it's also, uh, it's a fancy phone, but downloading images for 50 articles at a time seems like a, a lot of work for it to do. So it's possible that this is, uh, it's possible that this is tuned, is something that, that could be tuned or optimized. I don't know. I haven't noticed it using a lot of uh, battery or, or anything like that. So, and then while true in an in, in infinite loop, we are going to uh, get the article list. If it's empty, we will have some errors. And for all of the articles in the article list, we're going to say that the the fetch image event is in progress. We're going to get the article's content. So that should be like the HTML of the article. And uh, make sure content's not null. Append, append preview picture URL to content to fetch it too should probably be handled separately. So um, we're going to ask if the article has a preview picture URL. And if it doesn't, we're going to create one. Wait, what? If text details is, is empty. I don't know what we're doing here because isn't this empty? So what is it doing when we add it to? I'm not sure. Something's going on here. Maybe the second time you call it, something more interesting happens. Um, and then we have this image cache thing. And we're going to call cache images on 
the article ID as a long, I guess cast images wants a long, and the content. And then, or rather, if, if that cache lookup, I guess, succeeds, then we'll add changed articles to get article ID. Otherwise, we'll add processed articles. We'll add the article to process article. Okay. But, oh, okay. And then, uh, and then we iterate over the process articles. And if the, if we're done here, then we set images downloaded to true. And I'm guessing that maybe the cache images is the thing that actually downloads them. There's no comment, but uh, we're going to call find image URLs in HTML. So this is just going to do some kind of beautiful soup, beautiful soup style stuff. I forget what the Java one's called, like JSoup or something along those lines. Now we'll get the image URLs. And I'm guessing these probably are the real URLs. Like if it's a Wikipedia article, I'm guessing this is wikipedia.org or com slash blah, 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 as opposed to the the Wallabag URL, although I'm not positive. And then we get the article cache path, which is, I guess the path on disk. We set downloaded something to false. And then for each of the URLs, uh, if it starts with Wallabag relative URL, so I guess that's the stuff on the Wallabag, then we're going to try to get it from Wallabag, I suppose. Otherwise, we're going to parse the image URL if it's not blah, blah, blah. And then download image to cache. We're going to call it download image to cache. But it seems like the, it might have, the images might come from Wallabag sometimes. I, I still am getting the impression that they might come from not Wallabag as well. And then eventually we're using OKHTTP OK to make the, although we're connecting to Wallabag. Maybe. I don't know if Wallabag connection is necessarily connect, connecting to Wallabag. All right, I want to get, I want to be done with this and move on to another, um, another repo. But I still want to know about uh, playlists. So let me just ask the AIs. Oh, here we go. Look, it's looking good. We'll say, uh, I have a, an app that stores music playlists that can be edited. What is a good way to persist the playlist? How about, instead of what is a good way, how about describe some common ways to store playlists in a relational database. What are their trade-offs? Nice. Right, so it'll do that in the background. And since I mentioned playlists, let's move on to Jellyfin, or rather Finamp. 